Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. With the entire world in lockdown mode right now, we thought it'd be a good idea to bring you a very, very long video for those of you at home with nothing to do. So today we're gonna to be taking a look at the history of the entire third year of the Clone Wars. Chapter one, the Sith Dathmeri War. Asajj Ventress was more than just a Sith assassin. She came from an ancient race of Force users known as the Night Sisters from the planet of Dathomir. Legends say that the planet of Dathomir was one of the origins of the Force, and the planet itself contained a very special type of magical ichor that could not be found anywhere else in the galaxy. Some might even go as far to call the Night Sisters witches and their Force abilities magic. Now, the Night Sisters were more aligned with the dark side of the Force if you're using the Jedi and Sith's more archaic light side, dark side definition of the Force, but they weren't necessarily aligned with the Sith. The Night Sisters were one of the few groups of Force users that were able to survive throughout galactic history and evolve separately from the two mainstream schools of Jedi and Sith. They had a very ancient and strange connection to the Force that was quite different from how the Jedi and Sith used the Force. They had all sorts of special powers, including the ability to reanimate the dead and create ghostly specters. Anyway, Asajj Ventress was one of the most powerful Death Mary Night Sisters in her generation, and she was one of the rare witches who left her home planet. Most of her fellow Night Sisters weren't nearly as powerful in the Force and mostly gained their abilities from the planet's Iker, which meant that they would rarely venture away from the planet. Ventress was given away as a slave to the Cynatine pirate Halstead at a very young age, in return for protection for her entire clan. Halstead traveled to the planet of Ratatak with Ventress and was a surprisingly kind master to her, but was eventually killed by Weequay pirates. She was then rescued by a wayward Jedi Knight known as Kai Narek, who took Ventress in and began training her as a Jedi outside the confines of the temple. For 10 years, Ventress's master helped her harness her true potential in the Force, and she grew powerful underneath his care. But once again, disaster struck as the Weequay pirates came back and killed Kai Narek as well. Ventress fell into a vortex of hatred and dark side energy and massacred the Weequays with her master's lightsaber. Completely under the control of the dark side, Ventress didn't stop there. She slaughtered all of the pirates and bandits on the planet and basically took over, which is when she attracted the attention of Count Dooku, who took her in as his own apprentice. Dooku and Ventress's relationship was like that of most Sith pairs, uneasy, full of hatred and mistrust, but Dooku did see Ventress as a very capable and ultimately important part of his own plans. But of course, by the third year of the Clone Wars, Darth Sidious had also taken notice of his own apprentice's Sith assassin. Darth Sidious saw through Count Dooku's thinly veiled plan to ultimately overthrow him with Ventress's help, and so Darth Sidious demanded that Count Dooku cut ties with his new apprentice. And so during the Battle of Solus, as Ventress led Separatist forces against a Republic fleet led by Generals Kenobi, Skywalker, and Admiral Wolf Yolaren, Count Dooku plotted her demise. While Ventress was flying in her Genovex starfighter and chasing down the two Jedi Generals, she almost manages to kill Kenobi, but unfortunately her own ship is damaged by Skywalker, and all three of them crash inside the hangar of Ventress's flagship. Ventress immediately calls for reinforcements from Count Dooku, but her master betrays her and leaves her to die all alone. Of course, Ventress is a very skilled duelist and won't just lay down and accept defeat. She manages to seize both of the Jedi Generals in a forced choke, but before she ends their lives, another Separatist ship under the command of Count Dooku fires on her flagship, forcing all three of them to find a new way off the ship. Ventress somehow manages to escape before her ship is completely destroyed, but Dooku is none the wiser and reports to Darth Sidious that his apprentice has been killed. But of course that's not true, Ventress is a lot tougher than she looks, and a scavenger ship later picks her up. Unfortunately, they don't realize who Ventress is, and she quickly takes over their ship and heads off to the only home she has left, Death of Mir. Now you can say what you want about the Death Mary Night Sisters, but they definitely always look out for their own. Mother Talson immediately recognizes Ventress as the lost Night Sister from many years ago and quickly brings her back into the fold. Despite her extremely unpleasant demeanor, Ventress at her core is still a little girl looking for a home. All of her previous masters have either died or abandoned her, so having a home amongst the Night Sisters is very important for her. Mother Talzin listens to Ventress's plight and immediately agrees to help her. You see, Mother Talzin has her own beef and history with the Sith Order. 
Long ago, Darth Sidious traveled to Darth Amir and began training Talzin as his own apprentice, but Sidious would go on to betray Talzin and steal her son, Maul, and train him as his own new Sith assassin. Mother Talzin clearly hated the Sith Order even more than Ventress by this point, and was more than willing to help Ventress get her revenge. Talzin sends Ventress along with two of the most powerful Night Sisters, Karis and Naleth, to assassinate Count Dooku in his home on Sorana. Using the magical ichor of Darth Amir, Talzin makes all three of the assassins invisible and hands them captured lightsabers to kill the Count. This way, if the three are seen, they'll be mistaken for Jedi. The assassins find Dooku sleeping in his bed and quickly poison him with the dart. Dooku, sensing danger, wakes up and begins fighting the three assassins, but his vision is impaired because of the poison. But Dooku is powerful enough to hold the poison at bay with the force and quickly turns the table on the assassins with a large burst of Sith lightning, which sends them flying out the window. The assassins return to Talzin, they have failed in their plan, but the ploy with the lightsaber seems to have worked. Count Dooku is definitely aware of his new vulnerability now that his Sith assassin Ventress is no longer protecting him. Talzin will use this vulnerability as an opportunity to infiltrate the Sith by providing the Count with another apprentice that can help protect him. Dothomir was run by a matriarchal society. The Night Sisters held most of the power on the planet. But there was another tribe of male Dothamir Zabraks that lived on the other side of the planet known as the Night Brothers. They were subservient to the Night Sisters and spent their days training in various forms of melee combat and martial arts. Like the Night Sisters, the Night Brothers were all force sensitive, but they seemed to either lack the ability to tap into the magical ichor of the planet or just didn't understand how to access it. The Night Brothers trained so that they could prove their worth in the arena known as the Crucible. The most powerful Night Brothers were selected by the Night Sisters for mating and imbued with the magical ichor, which not only increased their force power, but actually increased their physical size and strength. It was basically like steroids. Mother Talzin invites Dooku to her planet while Asajj Ventress visits the Night Brother village. There, she puts several Night Brothers through the paces, and one Zabrak ends up standing out from the rest, Savage Opress. The Night Sisters juice up Savage with some magical ichor and present him to Dooku as his new secret apprentice, who will help him overthrow Darth Sidious. Little does Count Dooku know, Savage's true loyalty lies with Ventress and Mother Talzin. Dooku immediately sends his new apprentice on the warpath. He effectively leads Separatist forces against the Republic garrison on Devaron, massacring all in his path, including Jedi Master Halsey and his Padawan Nox. Delta Squad is sent to retrieve the bodies of the Jedi and bring them back to Coruscant. I love seeing clone commandos whenever possible. The Jedi immediately assume Count Dooku is behind all of this and uncover through surveillance videos the monstrous Zabrak known as Savage. Yoda is familiar with the Knight Brothers and commands Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin to go to Dathomir to find the root of this new evil. Immediately after landing, the Knight Brothers attack the two Jedi, but they prove too much for them to handle. They point the Jedi to the Knight Sisters after Anakin manages to disable their leader. Not wanting to start a second conflict with the powerful Jedi, Talzin is forced to help reveal where Savage Opress is and sends the Jedi on their way. Talzin is running out of time and asks Ventress to go join Savage and carry out their plan to take out Dooku before the Jedi are able to arrive. Ventress thinks Savage is not ready for this new confrontation, but agrees that the Jedi have complicated the situation and they need to carry out their plan as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Dooku continues to train Savage, who is definitely strong but lacks refinement. Dooku's Form 2 lightsaber style quickly neutralizes the brute's power attacks when they duel. Dooku also shows Savage the true power of the dark side and helps him use his emotions to fuel his Force powers. Satisfied with Savage's progress, Count Dooku sends him to Toidaria to capture the King Katnunko. During the first year of the Clone Wars, the King had chosen to align Tordaria with the Republic after Asajj Ventress was thwarted by Master Yoda. But before Savage Opress can leave with the King, the Jedi arrive on Tordaria and a melee ensues. In the middle of the duel while trying to stop the King from escaping, Savage accidentally kills him with a Force Choke. This really pisses off Count Dooku, who starts barbecuing his new apprentice with Sith Lightning. But before Savage is completely destroyed, Ventress appears, and the two team up and try to kill the Count. They manage to disarm Count Dooku, but before they can finish him off, the Count escapes and separates Ventress from Savage, and forces her on the defensive. Ventress doesn't really stand a chance one-on-one -on -one with Dooku, and has to escape on her own. 
She ends up leaving Savage behind to deal with the Jedi who have just recently arrived. To make matters worse, Dooku also sends his droids against his new apprentice. Savage barely makes it out alive and escapes. Wounded and betrayed, the Night Brother returns once again to Mother Talzin, who senses a new opportunity for her to exploit. You see, her son Maul was actually Savage's brother, and he needed someone to help him return him from exile in the Outer Rim. Maul would serve as a great teacher for Savage if he manages to find him. Chapter 2 Masters of the Force as the Clone Wars raged on all around the galaxy, a strange message was received on behalf of the Jedi by the Republic Navy. The message was in the form of a 2,000-year-old Jedi distress code, and it originated out in the Trilithium system in wild space. The Jedi Council decided to send Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin Skywalker, and Ahsoka Tano to investigate the mysterious signal. They were to rendezvous with the Venator-class Star Destroyer before making a final approach to the location in case this whole distress signal thing was a Separatist trap. But something strange happened when the Jedi reverted back to real space. They couldn't seem to find Captain Rex and the Star Destroyer sent to escort them, and soon their communications began to fail as well. The Jedi's shuttle shut down and the power cycled, and suddenly a gigantic floating construct appeared before them and started pulling their ship towards it, as if a tractor beam had gotten a hold of them. The Jedi pass out and wake up safely inside of a strange new world. Someone had landed the shuttle for them. Outside, they were greeted by a tropical paradise dotted with floating islands of rock and soil. They arrived to the ethereal realm of Mortis. Located in a place in between worlds and dimensions, Mortis was removed from the physical world and the actions of the beings that presided there. Time has very little meaning on Mortis. Days, weeks, and months could be spent there, and if one managed to return to their normal existence, no time will have passed at all in their own dimension. The planet was a very dreamlike and surreal place. As the day went on, the seasons and weather would change along with the light. While things were pleasant and sunny during the day, when night came, the vegetation would die and toxic rains would fall on the ground, turning the surface of the world uninhabitable. And as full darkness set in, lightning would shoot from the skies and bring luminous roots shooting up from the ground. The day and night cycle represented the balance between the light and the dark side. You see, Mortis was a fulcrum through which the entire galaxy's force was channeled through. This was actually all a part of George Lucas's grand plan. Apparently, he had outlined this entire episode by himself. Now, on the planet, there were three individuals known by many names. The Force Wielders, the Ones, the Celestials, the Architects. These were all powerful immortal beings, whose connection with the life energy of the galaxy allowed them to control the entire fabric of the cosmic force. It was said in legends that these three force wielders were originally known as celestials, members of an ancient civilization that predated even the Old Republic. The Celestials had ultimately met their downfall at the hands of the Rakatan Infinite Empire, a cannibalistic race of aliens that enslaved much of the core region of the galaxy and used technology that was powered by the dark side of the Force. The Celestials went to great lengths to keep the Rakatans at bay. It was said that they had the power to move the stars and planets using massive machines that generated gravitational fields. This is also why the Celestials were known as the architects by the many species that followed them. It was said that they used these gravity machines to create a barrier around the Rakan advance. Their plan ultimately did fail, and the three Celestials that did survive managed to do so by retreating to the Maw, located in the Kessel Sector of space. This was a strange cluster of black holes that had been constructed by the Celestials' gravity machines. Legends say that a Force Nexus was located in the Maw known as the Font of Power and the Pool of Knowledge. The three Celestials supposedly drank from the font of power and bathed in the pool of knowledge and became the godlike being known as the Force Wielders. These three Force users would take up the form of the father, the son, and the daughter. The father was the oldest of the three, and he was also the most powerful and neutrally aligned in the Force. The son was aligned to the dark side of the Force, and the daughter was aligned to the light side of the Force. The father's eternal job was to keep his two offspring from murdering each other. So despite their godly appearance, the gods of Mortis were like any other dysfunctional human family. 
The only problem was that the immortal father seemed to be slowly losing his power. He feared that if he died, then the son and daughter would once again start fighting and bring chaos and imbalance to the Force. This is why the Mortis Gods sent a distress signal to the Jedi Order. They were looking for the individual known as the Chosen One. The father assumed that Anakin was the Chosen One and would be powerful enough to rein in both his son and daughter. The Mortis Gods purposely separated Anakin from Obi-Wan and Ahsoka on their first night on the planet. The father introduces himself to Anakin and begins preparing a test to see if he is in fact the Chosen One. That night, as Anakin rests, he's confronted by a vision of his mother, Shmi. Anakin confides in his mother that he is torn over his past failures as a Jedi. He mentions feeling guilty about the massacre of the Sand People, along with his secret marriage with Padme. It's an interesting scene and one of the only times we see Anakin actually open up about his very dark actions, especially the murder of the Sand People. It shows us a side of Anakin that never really leaves him, even when he's Darth Vader. At the same time, Obi-Wan Kenobi that night is confronted by his former master, Qui-Gon Jinn. We're not really sure whether this is some sort of vision created by the Mortis Gods or if it's actually Qui-Gon Jinn in ghost form. Apparently, the cave they are staying in serves as an amplifier for all Force abilities. Qui-Gon warns Obi-Wan that Anakin must stay away from the planet because he's having trouble balancing himself within the Force. The power of this planet might tempt him and push him overboard. Ahsoka is also confronted with a vision as well. She sees a future version of herself warning her to remove her from Anakin's side, as his dark side tendencies will eventually become her own. Although all three Jedi are suspicious of their visions, all three of their visions do hold some measure of truth. The next day, Anakin undergoes his trial. Obi-Wan and Ahsoka have been captured by the son and daughter who are now in their animal forms. Anakin must choose to save one or the other, an impossible situation for him to face. So Anakin decides not to follow the rules and stops both the daughter and son in their tracks, which turns out to be the right move after all. The father decides Anakin is worthy, yet Anakin chooses not to accept the role and leaves. We're not really told why he does this, but if you really look at Anakin's future and his past, Power and the pursuit of power has never really been his downfall. Instead, it was his attachment to the people he loved that turned him to the dark side and was his greatest weakness. But before he can leave, the son kidnaps Ahsoka. His plan is to convince Anakin to join him on the dark side and together they can overcome the father and the light side. The daughter springs into action and takes Obi-Wan Kenobi to the altar of Mortis where the dagger of Mortis is held. This was an extremely powerful weapon that was capable of killing a force wielder. But before it can be used against the son, the son steals it and attempts to kill the father with it. In a last act of kindness, the daughter sacrifices herself and takes the blade instead. This stuns both the father and especially the son, who despite his alignment through the force, still loves his sister. The force is now in chaos and the father tells the Jedi to leave. They must not let the son escape the planet on their ship. The father has to destroy the sun or else the dark side will overwhelm the light side and the Sith will gain control of the galaxy. Ultimately, the father must confront the sun in the well of the dark side deep within Mortis. Anakin is there too and he once again has a vision. This time, he sees his future as Darth Vader. Anakin refuses to witness these images and he refuses to believe that they are true. The son, however, promises to prevent these terrible things from happening, and Anakin agrees to go along with him, just like how he will one day follow Palpatine in the hopes of preventing tragedy. The father finally arrives and is left with no other choice but to stab himself with the dagger of Mortis. The son is shaken by the actions of the father and makes peace with his father before he passes. In this moment of weakness, Anakin runs the son through with a lightsaber, and together, the two last gods of Mortis die. The Jedi awake back on their ship only seconds have passed in the real world. Anakin is left with the chilling knowledge of what he will one day become. Obi-Wan and Ahsoka also have their visions of this darkening future. The Mortis gods are gone, and if you believe the legends, it's said that their presence kept an even more ancient evil at bay. But since it's legends, we'll probably be fine. I hope. 
Chapter 3, The Prison for Fallen Jedi. Built 500 years before the Clone Wars had even started, the Citadel or Citadel Station was a supermax prison located on the partially destroyed planet of Lola Sayu. The Citadel was unique because it was specifically designed to hold Jedi who had fallen to the dark side, a very formidable type of individual to imprison. The Republic prison had fallen under the control of the Confederacy of Independent Systems in the first year of the war, and a sadistic Findian named O.C. Sobek was put in charge of the prison. Most of the organic personnel in the prison were removed and replaced with droids, and this prison, which was already pretty impenetrable, became even more difficult to escape. As a matter of fact, no one's ever escaped it in 500 years. The one-eyed Jedi Master, a member of the High Council, Even Peel, had been captured by Separatist forces along with his Republic Navy Captain, Wilhuff Tarkin. The two had been on a mission in the Outer Rim to recover the hyperspace route known as the Nexus Route. This was a secret route from the Outer Rim into the core regions of both the Separatist worlds and also the core of the Republic. Anyone who got their hands on these hyperspace routes would be able to carry out a massive secret attack against their enemy. Before the Republic forces had been captured, Master Peel had erased the data of the hyperspace lane from his ship's nav computer, and he and his commanding officer Tarkin both memorized half of the coordinates. Now the Separatists were working hard to crack Master Peel through the use of torture, but given the fact that he has a very deep Russian accent and one eye, it doesn't seem like he'll crack at all. The Republic has sent a small team of clone troopers led by Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker. Ahsoka Tano decides to disobey Anakin and tags along as well. That's exactly what her master would have done when he was a Padawan. Now, Lola Seiyu is protected by a large Separatist fleet, which is equipped with very powerful scanners that can detect the life forms. Anakin comes up with the brilliant plan of using recommissioned Separatist battle droids commanded by R2-D2 to pilot the strike team onto the planet. There's something very endearing seeing the B-1 battle droids footing for the Republic. In order to fool the lifeform sensors that were guarding the planet, the entire team is frozen in carbonite, which would stop all of their biosignatures and allow them to pass as inanimate cargo. There were, of course, some serious dangers with the procedure. Carbon sickness was a relatively common side effect of being frozen in carbonite. In extreme cases, it could even cause death. Less extreme symptoms of carbon sickness included temporary disorientation, headaches, nausea, and blindness. Luckily, because their trip was relatively short, none of the strike team suffered from any carbon sickness. And that was a good thing because the Citadel was perhaps one of the best designed prisons in the galaxy. For one, it was built over the giant sulfur rivers that ran throughout the planet. These were scalding pools of deadly liquid which cut off escape in every direction. Every approach to the facility was guarded, including even the cliff sides that went around the facility. These were usually mined with electroshock devices. Once inside, every corridor was monitored by CCTV, and the entire hallway could be electrocuted, making it difficult for even a Jedi to escape. The walls and ceilings were also magnetized, which could quickly disarm a person, or in Anakin's case, take his metal arm and attach it to the ceiling. Most of the important areas of the base were either ray shielded or secured by blast doors. There were also hidden blaster turrets all over the base. The whole place was a death trap, and the Separatists had rapid response units made up of all sorts of battle droids, command droids, and droidicas. It's not surprising that the clones and the Jedi set off the alarms before they even make it inside of the facility. Luckily for them, the Separatist commander wants them all alive so he can capture them as new prisoners. The strike force quickly makes it to Master Peel, and then shortly after freeing him, they free Captain Wilhuff Tarkin. Obi-Wan suggests that the group split in two and meet back at the shuttle. Obi-Wan will take Master Peel with them, and Anakin and Ahsoka will take Tarkin. Tarkin has his own plan. He wants them to stick together. This way, they can use their strength to their advantage. It's not surprising that Tarkin would want to collect all of their resources and put them in one place. He, after all, championed the Death Star later on in his career with the Empire. For now, Obi-Wan Kenobi's plan wins, and he quickly heads into the ventilation system with Master Peel. They'll use the prison's air system to make it to their shuttle, where R2-D2 and the friendly battle droids are waiting. The clones set several explosives on their way to create a big distraction. 
Anakin, having studied the ancient archive maps, cuts a hole through one of the prison walls and enters one of the original tunnels that were once in use when the prison was under Old Republic control. Meanwhile, back at the ship, R2-D2 and the battle droids are confronted by a tactical droid. The Separatists are highly suspicious of R2, as the shuttle has taken way too long to arrive after it had first approached the blockade. The tactical droids order the battle droids to arrest R2-D2, not knowing that they were actually working for the Republic. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan and Master Peel arrive near the shuttle bay and are ambushed by several droids. O.C. Sobek has created a trap for them, and now he has even more prisons to show to Count Dooku. But on their way to the prison cells, R2-D2 and his battle droids intercept the group and convince the Separatist battle droids to hand over the prisoners to their custody. Meanwhile, Anakin, Ahsoka, and Tarkin have found a sulfur pipe to climb through and avoid Separatist patrols. Interestingly enough, Anakin and Tarkin have a moment or two to discuss strategy and ideology. The two have far more in common than you would expect. Although Tarkin respects Anakin, he has his doubts about the Jedi. He sees their adherence to the Jedi Code as a weakness that enemies can exploit in battle. Tarkin believes that peacekeepers make poor soldiers. Rather than being offended, Anakin admits that he shares similar views. In the future, Tarkin and Anakin will once again work side by side. Whether Tarkin realizes that Darth Vader is Anakin is a whole nother discussion. As they finally find an exit out of the sulfur fuel line, the team is ambushed by a large squad of Separatist droids. Pinned down, Anakin decides to blow up the sulfur deposits and manages to break contact. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan and company with their fake B-1 battle droid guards attempts to board the ship once again. But before they can make it on, they're exposed. Giant laser turrets surrounding the hangar open fire, pinning them down. They're cut off from escape. Meanwhile, Anakin and his team finally arrive and they attempt to push back the Separatist droids, but before they can reach the ship, one of the turrets destroy it, taking out ARC Trooper Echo out as well. His fellow clone troopers, including Rex, assume that he's dead. But Echo's story doesn't end just yet. We'll probably see him again soon. After losing their shuttle, the Jedi and clones are in serious trouble. They're going to have to call for reinforcements. The Jedi Council received the strike team's distress signal, and Plo Koon is on his way with the fleet. Now all the Jedi and clones have to do is to hold on and evade capture until the fleet arrives. With a massive force of droids chasing them through the Sulphur Canyon surrounding the Citadel, the strike team finds themselves surrounded and trapped with a giant cliff behind them. Anakin commands the battle droids to stay behind and buy them some extra time. The battle droids agree without hesitation. They're even more loyal and brave than the clones in a way, and quickly are cut down. Thanks to their sacrifice, the strike team manages to rappel down the cliff, buying them a few seconds of reprieve. Plo Kloon's plan is to use his four Venator-class Star Destroyers to engage the enemy blockade, while a separate force of gunships escorted by fighters attempt to sneak by. They'll head to the rendezvous point on the surface of the planet and hopefully extract the rescue team before it's too late. The Jedi are unsure of how large the enemy fleet is. Plo Kloon is worried that they won't have much time to pull off this daring rescue. The Separatist fleet turns out to be quite formidable. It's made up of at least one Lucre Hulk battleship, one Providence-class cruiser, and four Munificent-class star frigates, along with a large complement of advanced droid fighters. The Republic fleet immediately faces heavy resistance and are unable to create a safe enough land for gunships to travel through. But Plo Kloon launches anyway and tries his best to cover the gunships with escort fighters. Meanwhile, the strike team faces a new and far more dangerous enemy, the canine-like Anubis. Originally from the planet of Tatooine, these creatures are excellent trackers and they immediately find the strike team. As they launch their attack, another group of droids make it onto the scene, including several battle droids flying speeders. In the ensuing battle, the Jedi and clones are once again successful at fending off the attackers, but Master Peel is seriously injured by one of the Anubas. Before he dies, he manages to pass on the other half of the hyperspace line coordinates. Osi Sobek even personally arrives at the end of the battle in a last-ditch attempt to stop the Republic rescue team from getting away. It's either he succeeds or he'll have to face Count Dooku's disappointment. O.C. manages to separate Tarkin from the group and almost kills him out of sheer frustration or rage, but Ahsoka spears him through in the last second, saving Tarkin and even extracting a very rare piece of gratitude from the captain. The gunships eventually arrive just in time, and the Republic manages to hold on to the codes for the Nexus route, delaying a bold separatist attack on Coruscant just a bit longer. Chapter 4 The Jedi Padawan Slave Trade most of us know Trandoshans thanks to the infamous bounty hunter known as Bosk. We first see him in Empire Strikes Back as one of the many bounty hunters being tasked with bringing Luke Skywalker and Han Solo in. 
Shred oceans are quite an interesting species and they came from an era when things were a bit more black and white and entire alien species were considered degenerates and evil. This was mainly because the trained oceans loved to hunt and much of their culture and upbringing was about hunting. It was actually a rite of passage for young trained oceans to hunt difficult and exotic game. So it's kind of weird that Star Wars is so judgy about them. I mean, aren't we supposed to be accepting of other cultures? As trade oceans continued chasing their love of the hunt and upgrading their technology and techniques for hunting, they also started looking for more difficult game to hunt, which eventually led them to the most dangerous game of all other sentient beings. So the Trandoshans originated from the world of Trandosha, otherwise known as Dosha. The planet was located in the Kashyyyk system, home of the Wookiees. Dosha was a tropical planet full of thick forests, which were basically perfect for honing your skills as a young hunter. Once the Trandoshans discovered spaceflight, they encountered the Wookiees and developed a very unique and close relationship with them. And by that I mean they started hunting the Wookiees. The giant hairy aliens were incredibly tough prey to hunt, which kind of made them even more enticing for the Trandoshans to chase after. The Trandoshans would also develop a lucrative slave trade business by selling the Wookiees they did capture to slavers. While Wookiees were stronger physically than Trandoshans, they also had a more peaceful society that wasn't infatuated with hunting other species. They were mainly put on the defensive against the Trandoshans, who had actually carried out missions to Kaishik and stalked their prey for days on end looking for any kind of weakness or opening to attack. Trandoshans had a superior hunting culture, and every young Trandoshan was taught how to hunt from a very young age. They also had the ability to see in infrared range, which helped them separate prey from the dense backgrounds of a forest or jungle. The Trandoshans also had an excellent sense of smell and could also regenerate lost limbs. Wookiees oftentimes ripped off the arms and legs of Trandoshan hunters to slow them down. Now, in Trandoshan society, hunting was so important that their main deity that everyone worshipped was known as the Scorekeeper. The Trandoshans would appease this god so that they can increase their own Jagannath points. The more Jagannath points a Trandoshan hunter earned, the higher their place in the afterlife. Trandoshans earn points by doing things like capturing species, especially rare individuals like silverback Wookiees. But if a Trandoshan is captured during a hunter's shame somehow, their Jagannath points would drop back to zero. However, if they killed the individual who erased all of their points, they would get all those points back. It's definitely a weird belief system and led to the Trandoshans becoming extremely violent and infatuated with killing things. Now, with the beginning of the Clone Wars, the Trandoshans were finally able to leave the Republic, which was not only against slavery, but also very against hunting sentient beings. They basically called this activity murder, which is kind of insensitive to the religious beliefs of the Trandoshans and kind of a strange stance for a galactic-wide government to take, especially one as progressive and forward-thinking as the Republic. The Confederacy of Independent Systems was more about planetary rights, blah blah blah, and so the Trandoshan Hunting Guild was able to set up a wildlife sanctuary on the moon of Washka. And by wildlife sanctuary, I mean an island full of sentient beings for the Trandoshans to hunt. This is basically that Predators movie where the Yakuza guy takes down one of the aliens with a katana, which is basically one of humanity's finest moments. Anyway, while the Trandoshans really enjoyed hunting Wookiees, they also liked going around the galaxy and finding even more exotic prey. In their hunting lounge, you can actually see on the wall trophies from past hunts. There's even an old Mandalorian Neo Crusader helmet from the Old Republic era. One of the Trandoshans' favorite game, however, were young Jedi Padawans. A full-grown Jedi Knight, even disarmed, was too powerful in the Force to hunt for even the strongest Trandoshans. But Jedi Padawan were still developing their powers and weren't necessarily skilled enough or powerful enough to fight a larger hunter, especially when they didn't have access to their lightsabers. The Trandoshans took advantage of all the chaos going around in the galaxy, and they basically roamed around battlefields looking to take advantage of young Padawan. During the Battle of Felucia, Republic forces under the command of Plo Koon, Anakin Skywalker, and Ahsoka Tano were preparing to assault a walled Separatist city. Ahsoka was commanded to scale the enemy base's back wall. While attempting to do this, a group of Trandoshans hit her with a stun net. To make matters worse, this group of Trandoshans was led by Garnak, who was basically the leader and head of the Trandoshan hunting lodge. Garnak's son, Dar, was actually about to finally join the guild, and Garnak, being the good father he was, thought it'd be a great gift for his son to hunt the young Jedi Padawan they had just captured. Ahsoka is brought to the moon of Washka along with several other prisoners and is released into the wild. 
Several of the prisoners are gunned down immediately by the Trandoshans, but Ahsoka manages to make it to the forest, where she eventually runs into three other Jedi younglings, Khalifa, Omer, and Jinx. They had actually been captured during a training mission and were stuck in the wildlife preserve for quite some time. Although these other younglings were similar in age to Ahsoka, Ahsoka was definitely quite skilled, perhaps one of the most talented Padawan of her class and generation. She had, after all, been fighting alongside Anakin Skywalker for a few years now, and if she could keep up with him, she could probably keep up with anyone. That night, Ahsoka is filled in on their situation, and the Jedi prepare for another day of running away from the Hunters. You see, the Jedi had to basically change locations every night because the Tyrant Oceans could not only see them in the dark, they could also smell them pretty easily. And not only did the Trandoshans get to sleep in comfortable beds every night and were well rested every morning for the hunts, they also had repulsor craft to speed them around the game preserve and they also had advanced weapons to kill their game. During the first days of the hunt, Ahsoka Tano takes the offensive and surprises a Trandoshan hunter, but without her lightsaber, the full grown reptile is able to overpower her. Khalifa comes out of nowhere and saves Ahsoka by choking the reptile. Ahsoka stops Khalifa from killing the lizard and prevents her from falling to the dark side. The younglings have obviously suffered a lot of loss by this time, and a lot of them are basically losing it. Jedi Code was much easier to follow within the safe confines of civilization and the Jedi Temple. When death came for a Jedi, many would oftentimes reach to the dark side in order to save themselves. After surviving the day's hunt, Ahsoka realizes that the other Jedi are completely lost and demoralized. What they really need right now is a victory and a strategy, so she chooses to go on the offensive. She realizes that they cannot continue running because they're only getting weaker each day from a lack of food and rest, and eventually they will be caught by the Trandoshans. What the Jedi need to do is strike back and attack the Trandoshan's main base. The next day, Dar, the son of Garnak, attempts to track down Ahsoka and claim her as his entrance ticket into the Hunter's Lodge. Khalifa is shot during the pursuit, but before Dar can take her out, Ahsoka intervenes and goes hand to hand with him. The young Trandoshan falls down onto a large thorn, which kills him. Garnak goes into a frenzy over the death of his son and shoots Khalifa, wounding her mortally. Ahsoka manages to evade the vengeful Garnak for now and makes it back to the rest of the Jedi youngling. Despite Khalifa's demise, Ahsoka is still determined to continue fighting and escape this planet. Her next plan is to attack the dropship that will be arriving the next morning to deliver more prey onto the reserve. When the dropship arrives, they quickly are able to board and jump the pilot and take it down. But there's only one prisoner on board, the legendary Wookiee warrior known as Chewbacca. And Chewbacca was not only a great fighter, he was also a great mechanic and tinkerer. His plan is to assemble a transmitter so that he can contact his Wookiee people for backup. Unfortunately, they're missing the necessary parts required to build the radio, so they need to head back to the downed ship to get the required parts. When they return, they find a Trandoshan sniper set up overlooking the site. The Jedi manage to overwhelm him, and now they have their own captive. Chewbacca puts the transmitter together and sends out a signal, but they don't get a response. Frustrated, the Jedi decide to use their captive, Trandoshan, and have him call in a rescue ship, which they, of course, ambush and take over. While Jedi younglings seem to have some problems fighting full-grown Trandoshans, Wookiees definitely do not. They take their captured rig to the Trandoshan Lodge, and a fight ensues for control of the platform. The Jedi and the Wookiees don't have any blasters, and things are quite balanced for the moment, until the Trandoshans successfully shoot down the Jedi's stolen repulsor lift and recapture their prey. But then, out of nowhere, Wookiee General Tarful arrives with a few bounty hunters to save the day. It seems like the Wookiees actually did get Chewbacca's transmission after all. Together, the Wookiees and Jedi manage to push back the Trandoshans and take over the platform. Ahsoka engages Garnak in some hand-to-hand -hand combat and succeeds in defeating him, showing us that the young Padawan, despite what her master thinks, is quite formidable and prepared for any threat she might face. I go as far to say that she's ready for knighthood. Chapter 5. Mon Calamari Civil War There were a few worlds in the galaxy that were considered untouchable either because of their political or cultural significance, such as Coruscant and, well, Alderaan. There were other worlds that were industrial and economic powerhouses like Quant and Fondor with their own orbital shipyards. They had enough power to leverage their own freedom. Mon Kyla, also known as Dock by the locals, was also one of these types of planets. The oceanic world was located in the outer rim far removed from the galaxy on the end of its own hyperspace lane. But it was known for producing some of the best starships in the galaxy along with terrific explorers and merchants. 
with a population of over 27 million sentient beings and with various exotic and unique cultures under the oceans. Doc was a major powerhouse in that region of the galaxy and provided all sorts of unique and exotic goods and foodstuff for the rest of the galaxy. The two main types of people on Mon Cala were the Mon Calamari and the Corns. These two species had lived alongside each other for tens of thousands of years. The fact that one species has not wiped out the other is a testament to their tolerance. That or these two species are so uniquely balanced and dependent on each other that they can't destroy the other. The Mon Calamari were more fish-like in appearance and more adapted to the shallower areas of the sea. Because of this, they built their cities closer to the surface. They also ran the few cities on Mount Cala that were above the water on reefs and atolls. The Mon Cala were an aquatic species that could breed underwater, but they were also pretty well adapted to living on land. Culturally speaking, the Mon Cala were quite peaceful and open-minded. They also tended to be quite romantic and passionate about life, which is why their society has created more than their fair share of artists, adventurers, and military leaders. Creativity was extremely important for the Mon Cala society. For instance, the shipbuilders considered every ship they constructed a piece of art, which is why no two Mon Calamari cruisers are the same shape, size, or design. It was said that the shipbuilders saw their designs as more of a living work of art rather than just a simple tool or weapon. Without mass-produced designs, this meant that each ship was built custom with very organic features, and every ship had its own strengths and therefore were hard to predict and fight against. The Mon Cala ships were also extremely durable thanks to the species' experience with building underwater pressurized cities. Mon Calamari starships were treasured all across the galaxy for these reasons. Now, the species' open-mindedness and curiosity for the unknown meant that many Mon Cala would become adventurers, and they would be the first from their planet to establish trade routes and political connections with neighboring worlds. That meant that the Mon Calamari naturally became the traders and diplomatic representatives of their world as well. And because they were more likely to travel away from their world, they adapted a more galactic taste for art, food, and design. They felt connected to the rest of the Republic and therefore fully embraced the idea of being a part of it. The Corns were the opposite to the Mon Calamari in many ways. More squid-like in nature, the Corns could handle the pressures of the deepest part of the oceans quite well. And so they lived on the ocean floor and in its many abysses isolated from the rest of the galaxy. The Corns disliked light and enjoyed being able to hide in the shadows. Unlike the Mon Calamari, the Corn society developed to be very proud, xenophobic, and isolationist. For instance, the average Corn would only speak its native tongue and avoid basic, whereas most Mon Calamari could speak basic and did it quite often. The Corns were in charge of many deep ocean mining operations and refineries, which helped supply materials for the shipyards run by the Mon Calamari. Now, in Legends, it was said that the Corns first rose up from the depths of the ocean and encountered the Mon Calamari somewhere around 4,500 years before the Battle of Yavin. The Corns quickly attacked the Mon Calamari, but they had inferior technology compared to the surface dwellers and were quickly defeated. The Mon Calamari realized that if they continued this war against the Corns, they would most likely drive their species to extinction, which they really didn't want. They wanted cooperation, so the Mon Cala came up with a very creative and outside of the box kind of uh, solution to this problem, which is very Mon Cala. What they did was they took a hundred young corns and taught them as if they were one of their own. These captives learned about Mon Calamari art, science, and ethics, and once they reached adulthood, those corns were sent down below to rejoin their society. At first, the corns from down below did not trust these Mon Cala corns, and the Mon Cala corns saw their own people as kind of backwards and barbaric. But by the time these young corns had gotten older, their superior education allowed them to exert a massive amount of influence on their society. This would be the beginning of a very beneficial relationship between the Mon Cala and the corns. Soon, the corns were brought up to date with the rest of the galaxy, and the corns started traveling off-world for work and adventure. Things were relatively good for many centuries, but when the Separatist crisis occurred, things started to change. You see, the Confederacy of Independent Systems was really good at taking a unified planet and finding an opposition to start a civil war. Most planets had a political party or second species that were unhappy with the status quo, and overnight, these opposition groups were offered massive amounts of resources and money to expand their movement. And if one principal individual refused to take the Separatist offer, 10 other highly ambitious individuals would take his place. On Mon Cala, that individual happened to be Senator Teeks, representative of the Mon Cala star system. Senator Teeks was a very crafty businessman before he entered politics, and he remained one once he was in office. 
During the separatist crisis, Teeks was implicated with other senators for operating a slave ring and was forced to escape from Coruscant while under investigation. He quickly found his way to Count Dooku and pledged the support of Moncala to the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Even though he was under investigation, he was still technically holding his spot as the representative for Moncala. And so the Moncalamari people quickly appointed a pro-Republic Corn politician to Teak's former position to avoid further confusion and embarrassment. It looked like for a moment at least the disaster was averted, Moncala would remain in the Republic. But Teeks now continued to work behind the scenes, growing a movement known as the Corn Isolation League. The Corn Isolationist League was not necessarily an independence movement. Instead, it was just concerned that the monarch of Moncala was always a Mon Calamari and never a Corn. As the Clone Wars continued to expand and the galactic economy continued shrinking, more and more Corns started supporting the Corn Isolation League. Even Corn chieftain Nosar Ri began feeling the pressure. The Separatists, as always working behind the scenes, sent their own ambassador Rift Hampson to monitor the situation. Tamsin quickly went to work and murdered King Colina, the monarch of Moncala. This instability presented a unique opportunity for the Corn Isolation League to push for their agenda. King Colina's successor, Prince Litra, was considered far too young and inexperienced for this position. No sir, and his Corns walked out of the meeting with the Mon Calamari when they could not agree to terms about who would be the next monarch for the planet. Unbeknownst to the Mon Calamari, the Corn Isolation League had been militarizing its members. Separatist agent Rift Hampson had also brought along with him a sizable army of aquatic droids to support the Corn Rebellion. Shortly after the meeting between the Mon Calamari and Corns fell apart, a massive attack is carried out by the Corn Isolation League against the Mon Cala. Unprepared, the Mon Cala are quickly overwhelmed. Luckily, the Jedi Council had already sent several of their own ambassadors along with an attachment of clone troopers trained for underwater combat. The scuba troopers and Jedi managed to link up with the new king, Lee Char, and help keep him safe as he waged war against the Korans. The Republic reinforcements managed to push back the Koran revolution from the capital, but soon after they were back again with a massive fleet of hydroid medusas, which were essentially electrified gigantic jellyfish cyborgs. The Republic forces are immediately routed and forced to hide inside of caves outside the capital city, which has fallen to the Confederacy. Riff Tamsin, under orders from Count Dooku, has basically taken over control of the Civil War and has turned it into a full-on Separatist invasion. Using his army of droids and the Corn extremists, the citizens of the Mon Cala capital are captured and put to work in internment camps. This deeply worried Nosari, who immediately protests against Tamsin. You see, the real reason why Riff Tamsin is here is because he was promised stewardship of the planet once it was taken over by pro-Confederacy troops. The Jedi are now hiding in caves along with what remains of the scuba troopers and Royal Mon Calamari troops that are left. They managed to call for reinforcements from the Jedi High Council before all communications off-world were cut. Back on Coruscant, the Jedi Council runs into a big problem. First, the clone army, as usual, was spread thin, but more importantly, there were very few units in the clone army trained for underwater combat. And they were all preoccupied at the time or already deployed on Mon Cala. General Kenobi, always prepared to think outside the box, suggests that they bring the Gungans in instead. Senator Jar Jar Binks is able to back the plan, and the Gungan High Council agrees to arrange for the troops. And before the Republic forces on Mon Cala are overrun, the Gungan army arrives and quickly turns the tide. Rift Tamsin then uses one of his Trident-class assault ships to create a massive underwater whirlwind around the battle. This disorients the Republic forces and scatters their offensive. When the dust finally settles, the majority of Republic forces have been captured by the Confederacy. However, King Lee Char and the Jedi Padawan Ahsoka Tano have escaped the disastrous battle and remain free from capture. From a strategic level, it looks like the Confederacy of Independent Systems have won the battle, but in reality, this was no longer looking like a justifiable civil war. Instead of allowing animosity to build up naturally between the Corns and the Mon Cala, the Confederacy's very blunt and visible use of droids have made this just another battle of the Clone Wars. The capture and slavery of Mon Calamari civilians is especially hard for the Corn populace to swallow. You see, the Corn Isolation League was just a small, extreme faction within the larger Corn population, and even they were uncomfortable with enslaving their neighbors. No one really wanted that kind of situation to happen. Count Dooku, Rift Tamsin also seemed to lack any respect for No Siri, and quickly the Corn Chieftain is beginning to realize the mistake he has made. Lee Char with Ahsoka's help with reaches people in the prison camp and call for their support to overthrow not the Corn Isolation League, but the CIS. 
And just as quickly as Mon Cala fell apart, it came together under the combined leadership of Lichar and Nosari, and overthrew Rift Hansen and his Separatist forces. This would just be the beginning of Lichar's reign, one that would be full of conflict. Unfortunately, Mon Cala, because of its rich economy and industrial output, presented a pretty big target for outside powers, and for the next several decades, peace would be elusive for these aquatic people. Chapter 6, Naboo and Gungan Tension. Located in the mid-rim of the galaxy, Naboo was discovered or maybe rediscovered by humans pretty early on in galactic history. A group of human refugees from the core planet Grismalt had crash-landed on Naboo back in the days before hyperdrives were a viable method of FTL travel. It used to take entire generations to travel from one star system to another, so these Grismalt refugees who had just escaped a terrible war on their old home planet decided to settle down on Naboo. They didn't really have another choice. The planet was extremely beautiful and relatively uninhabited. The local species known as the Gungans first avoided contact with these humans and retreated to their hidden underwater kingdom. When the two sides finally met, diplomacy failed and the inevitable skirmishes started happening between these two groups of people. Neither the Grismalt human colonists or the Gungans were an especially militarized society and there was never a real push to eradicate the other side. Gradually, an uneasy and unofficial peace would settle down the fighting on the planets. The Gungans also mainly lived underwater, so that kind of helped. In Legends, an ancient reptile race had invaded the planet and forced the Gungans to build massive cities underwater to escape slavery. The Gungans developed technologies to make life underwater safe and comfortable, and soon they fully adapted to it. This meant that although they shared a planet, the Naboo, as the humans were called, would rarely encounter these Gungans, and the two sides would rarely fight for the same resources as well. Now, Naboo's outer core was surrounded by a layer of plasma. This plasma throughout the course of the planet's history created many tunnels through the planet that may travel very quick and simple through the center of the planet. I would say safe, but there are giant sea monsters there. The Gungans eventually figure out how to use these passages so that they wouldn't need to come out of the water to travel across the planet. The plasma energy from the core would also be harnessed by both the Gungans and the Naboo as a cheap and bountiful energy source. And so, instead of becoming vicious enemies, the Gungans and Naboo learned to live apart from one another. That was until the Naboo crisis occurred. Although Naboo had many natural beauties and was a very pleasant place to live with high living standards, it wasn't really considered a powerful planet or an important planet. It lacked any real industry or commerce and mainly served as an art, culture, and tourism center. Given the planet's low population and the treasury's low capital, the plasma reserves beneath Naboo were never fully exploited for export purposes. What Naboo desperately needed to jumpstart their economy were investors, uh, mining companies, and also construction firms. Not only would the Naboo need to drill for the plasma, they would also need to refine the plasma and ship it somehow. The spaceport in Naboo's capital, Thede, wasn't even large enough to handle such a big industrial endeavor. Ultimately, the Naboo King Bun Tapala was approached by Damask Holdings, a shadow broker with links to the intergalactic banking clan. Damask Holdings was able to provide the resources necessary to start this massive mining project immediately, turning Naboo from a mid rim world very few people visited to a major player in the galactic energy market. Of course, this now meant that Naboo was a part of this wider game of galactic domination, which would be bad for Naboo. The Mask Holdings, the shadow broker who created the deal, was actually run by Darth Plagueis, the master of Darth Sidious. Years later, when the Galactic Senate passed Prop 3181-4D, it essentially erased the free trade zone that allowed organizations like the Trade Federation to take over massive expanses of the Outer Rim. And so the Trade Federation blockaded Naboo in protest and threatened to starve the planet until Prop 3181-4D was removed. In their moment of need, Queen Amidala of Naboo approached the Gungan King for help she was able to convince their leader, Boss Nass, that the separate destroyed army would turn on the Gungans after they gained complete control of the surface of the planets. In return for their help, the Gungans would be uplifted as equal partners in governance of the planet. This included the appointment of a Gungan representative for Naboo in the Galactic Senate. The Gungans would fight nobly against this ever destroyed army during the war, and Queen Amidala would keep her word. The following decades would see an increase in trust and cooperation between these two groups of people. By the time the Clone Wars had started, the planet was pretty much united and very loyal to the Republic. 
As we mentioned in our last video, just weeks before the Gungan Royal Army had mobilized and deployed thousands of Gungan warriors to assist Mon Cala in their own civil war against the Korans. Jar Jar Banks had become an elected representative for the Gungans and Naboo. He was viewed as kind of a hero for his actions during the invasion of Naboo, and also one of the key reasons why the Gungans and Naboo were at peace, an arrangement that greatly benefited both sides. Jar Jar was a trusted member of Papatine's inner circle. Palpatine had held Jar Jar's seat not too long ago, and most likely the two Dark Lords had an understanding between them. Whenever Palpatine needed something done, Jar Jar was there to convince the Gungan people to do it. The leader of the Gungans at the time was a male Gungan called Boss Leone. He was also quite pro-Republic and presented a challenge for the Separatist Alliance. After the Battle of Mon Cala, it was clear that the swamp creatures from Naboo were causing some major issues. The Gungans were too loyal and proud to betray the Republic, so instead, Count Dooku manages to slip in an operative into the King's High Council, an elderly Gungan by the name of Rish Lu. Rish Lu was well practiced in the mystical arts and manages to put a mind control necklace on Boss Leone. With the boss completely underneath his control, Rishlu started a very populous campaign championing war against their neighbors, the Naboo. The Gungans aren't exactly the most complicated people, and soon, Boss Leonu's call for war is heard and spreads throughout the populace. Although Naboo seems like the more powerful faction on this planet, the Gungans actually outnumber the humans almost three to one. Senator Banks witnesses this change within the populace, and he sends for Padme and Anakin Skywalker. Upon meeting Boss Leone, it becomes immediately noticeable that the boss is under some kind of mind control. Anakin immediately spots the source of the mind control and takes off the necklace around the boss's neck. Leone returns to his normal self. He tells the Republic envoys that his advisor, Rish Lu, is the one who had given him the necklace. But when they arrive in Rish Lu's dwelling, the advisor runs away and stabs Boss Leone, knocking him unconscious. The Republic envoys are running out of time, the Gungan army is already preparing to attack, and now Rish Lu has appeared in front of that army claiming that the boss had died and his last command was for the Gungans to attack the capital of Thede alongside Separatist droid forces. Yes, the same droids that only a decade before killed massive amounts of Gungans on the battlefield. It seems though that Boss Leone's populist message has already gathered tons of support, mainly based on lies about the Naboo. The Gungans were ready to retake their planet. It also should be noted that when the Gungans volunteered to assist the Mon Calamari in the civil war against the separatist back horns, the Republic were really careless with how they deployed their forces. Many Gungans died in the battle because of poor tactics and heavy enemy resistance. So it's not that surprising that many Gungans were angry at the Republic and were looking for some sort of revenge. The Republic envoys are running out of time with Boss Leone incapacitated. There's no way they could counter Rich Lu's order now, unless they were able to figure out how to wake up Boss Leone or maybe impersonate him. You see, Jar Jar Banks apparently looked like Boss Leone. He was also a powerful dark side force user with plenty of persuasion abilities thanks to the force. And soon Jar Jar Banks was running around in front of the troops like Boss Leone and pointing fingers at Rish Lu, who Jar Jar said had misled them all. The Gungan army quickly turns on Rish Lu, forcing the advisor to flee once again. This time Anakin chases the advisor all the way back to his lair, where Count Dooku is waiting for him. It's a trap! Dooku quickly skewers Rish Lu and engages Anakin in combat with the help of four of his Magna Guard droids. Although Anakin is far stronger this time around, he's still unable to beat the Count and gets shocked into submission by his guards. Dooku now has a very valuable prisoner in his possession. Meanwhile, back to the Gungan army. The invasion of the Naboo capital of Thede has been postponed, but a giant Separatist force has now landed as well. The Gungans and droids were supposed to march together to the city, and General Grievous was now here on the planet ready to lead the charge. Jar Jar, still disguised as the boss, tries to buy some time and stalls General Grievous with his usual nonsense. Meanwhile, the Gungan General Tarpal is outside shutting down the entire droid army, and he manages to finish just in time. Jar Jar continues to insist that the invasion of Thede is now cancelled and finally sets General Grievous off. The cyborg chases Jar Jar out of his command ship and finds his entire army deactivated. He now is surrounded by the Gungan army. The cyborg manages to kill General Tarpal, a veteran of the blockaded Naboo, but before the old Gungan dies, he manages to shock Grievous, which opens him up to more attacks from the other Gungan warriors. Now the Republic also has their own very valuable prisoner for exchange. Dooku contacts Padme, who he knows is involved with Anakin, and calls for an exchange between the Jedi General and Cyborg General. 
From a strategic point of view, Anakin is probably worth a little less than General Grievous. Although Anakin was a skilled fighter and a great leader, there were plenty of other Jedi who could fill his shoes. General Grievous, on the other hand, had no equals within the CIS. His capture could severely affect the Confederacy's abilities to wage war. Also, because of her relationship to Anakin, Padme probably should have excused herself from the negotiations and contacted the Republic government before negotiating with Separatists. But no, in the end, love wins. Chapter 7, The Battle of Umbara. It's relatively difficult to create a standardized army that works against all types of enemies on all types of terrain, environments, on all types of worlds. While the Grand Army of the Republic's main foe was the Separatist Alliance and their droid armies, the Republic would oftentimes have to engage local planetary defense forces and local militias. The planet of Umbara was located in the expansion region of the galaxy and carefully hidden within the Ghost Nebula. Its location meant that it was more or less cut off from the rest of the galaxy, and visitors rarely stepped foot on Umbara, and Umbarans rarely left their home planet. It's for this reason that the Umbarans were able to develop advanced technologies that were quite different from the rest of the galaxy. This included very advanced weapons and vehicles that the Republic forces have never seen before. At the beginning of the Clone Wars, the Umbarans had been a member state of the Republic, but joined the Confederacy shortly after their representative was assassinated on Coruscant. It should also be noted that Umbara had a massive reserve of dunium on their planet, which was a crucial material used in the construction of starships, and of course, Republic strategists could not let this dunium fall into Separatist hands, and so they launched an invasion onto Umbara. The Republic sends a task force of six Jedi and the 501st Legion and a 212th Attack Battalion to convince the planet to rejoin the Republic. Their main target is the capital city of Umbara, Umbara. The plan was simple. The 212th would land to the south and establish a foothold before advancing onto the city from that location, while Anakin's 501st Legion would advance from the north. Umbar was constantly bathed in darkness thanks to the lack of any bright stars in the vicinity of the planets, and the surface was also covered in fog, limiting visibility. Anakin would send his forces straight in on LAAT gunships with minimal fighter coverage. He would then use a giant pool of ATRT mechanized walkers to lead an assault on unbarmed positions at the LZ and follow up with his infantry forces. The idea was that you speed and surprise to overwhelm the enemy defenses before they could regroup and strike back. The Umbaran militia was equipped with advanced combat suits that pumped performance-enhancing gases into their soldiers. The landing zone was also defended by Umbaran hover tanks, which fired massive electromagnetic plasma projectiles, which could do a ton of splash damage. But the hover tanks' firing rates and projectiles are too slow to take out the clone's ATRT, and soon most of the hover tanks are destroyed around the LZ, and the Umbarans are routed. Anakin's bold and aggressive attack seems to have paid off at first. Aside from some giant carnivorous plants, there are very few clone casualties in this initial assault. But the Umbaran militia has actually purposely retreated to better defensive positions, and soon the Republic forces rush right into a trap and are surrounded in a valley and under heavy fire from nearby hilltops and fortifications. At the same time, the Umbarans have deployed several millicreep droids. These were tiny insect-like weapons that could crawl into enemy positions and electrocute organics. Several clones were taken down before the Republic forces realized what was going on. Having to deal with both the Millicreep droids within their perimeter and the Umbaran militia closing in around them, Anakin quickly decides to call in an airstrike right on top of their position. It's a risky call, but ultimately a good call. Anakin has once again prevented his soldiers from being overrun. But as they regroup and prepare to march on the capital, Anakin is recalled to Coruscant by Chancellor Palpatine. He is to be replaced by Jedi Master Pon Krell. We're not really sure why Palpatine withdraws Anakin from the battlefield and whether he does it on purpose. You guys can be the judge of that. Now, Pon Krell was an extremely well-respected Jedi Master who also happened to be an excellent commander. He was known as an individual who always made sure to reach his objectives and take them, but he was also known for exposing his clones to massive casualties. Things immediately start off pretty bad between Krell and the 501st. Captain Rex, who was used to being treated as an equal by Anakin Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Ahsoka Tano, found Krell to be both disrespectful and even cruel towards him and the rest of the clones. Still, clones obey the chain of command, and Krell has proven himself to be an excellent combat leader. 
The 501st continue marching on the road to the capital, and en route they're attacked by a pair of banshees, just another example of the wonderful local fauna. Krell shows off some impressive Jedi stunts and manages to grab one of them in midair and slaughters it. Far less impressive, though, is his strategy to continue towards the capital using the main road. The Umbarans by this point know that the Republic are coming, and their infantry column is completely exposed. Without armor or air cover on station, the clones are relatively vulnerable to an Umbaran counterattack. But Krell wants speed and orders the clones to attack along the main road directly towards the city anyway. One of the forward platoons of the 501st column quickly stumbles upon a landmine field and prepared defenses and triggers an Umbaran ambush. The platoon manages to hold up against the initial heavy Umbaran onslaught and are able to break contact long enough to retreat to the rest of the 501st, and together the clones beat back the ambush. But before the 501st can advance again, the Umbarans launch another even heavier counterattack. Things are not going well, and casualties are starting to increase. But just in the nick of time, Obi-Wan Kenobi with the 212th Attack Battalion sends an order to the 501st to take over a nearby Umbaran airfield that is resupplying the capital. It should be a much easier target for the 501st to take, and so quickly they disengage and march towards it. Upon reaching the outskirts of the airbase, Rex prepares to have his men scout out the defenses of the location. But once again, Krell stresses the urgency of the situation and tells his men to quickly launch a frontal assault on the airbase with no scouting or preparation. To make matters worse, the path to the airbase that he wants them to take goes right through a gorge that is so narrow that the men will have to file through in single file order. The clones are close to mutinying, which is quite shocking and almost never happens. But once again, Rex reins them in and tries to make the best of a terrible situation. The clones are immediately attacked by strange caterpillar tanks armed to the teeth, and then a massive spider-like Umbaran tank appears over the horizon. The Republic has never encountered such vehicles and don't know exactly how to bring them down. To make matters worse, most of these vehicles are heavily shielded. Things are looking quite grim, but the clones are some of the best fighters in the galaxy, and they quickly improvise strategies to tackle these new enemy vehicles. Still, the massive Umbaran spider tanks are way too heavily armored to bring down with conventional weapons, so Rex sends Fives and Hardcase to steal two Umbaran starfighters from the airfield and try to use them to take out the tank. Umbaran vehicles have extremely different control interfaces in their cockpits, and these starfighters don't even have physical cockpits. Instead, the pilot is simply ray shielded in a bubble. Luckily, the clones manage to eventually get these ships into the air, and they quickly wreak havoc on the Umbaran forces down below and take out the massive Umbaran spider tanks. Shortly after, the 501st marches into the airbase victoriously and seizes it for the Republic, despite Krell's terrible leadership. With the airbase now under their control, the Umbarans launch several offensives to retake their territory. Meanwhile, on the other side of the city, the 212th are being pushed back away from the capital thanks to new long-range missiles that are being supplied to the Umbarans by Separatist supply ships. The Republic's own fleet is outgunned by the Separatist fleet over the planet, and they're unable to stop these shipments. Before Krell can coordinate with Kenobi on how to assault the city next, their connection breaks, and so Krell decides once again that attack is the best way forward, and tells Rex to prepare the 501st for another frontal assault against the city in 12 hours. When Rex relays this information to his men, they of course disapprove of the General's orders. Five suggests an alternative strategy. He and a few of the other clones could pilot the captured Umbaran starfighters and use them to infiltrate the Separatist fleet and destroy their supply ships from within. Krell, of course, vetoes this idea immediately, and so Fives, along with Jesse and Hardcase, disobey orders and immediately launch their mission. They fly straight into orbit and directly through a massive space melee between Umbaran and Separatist forces and the Republic Navy. Fives tells his fellow clones a story that Anakin Skywalker had told them about. When he was a child, he had successfully blown up an entire droid control ship during the blockade of Naboo. The clones decide to follow that strategy and fly straight into the separate supply ship. The plan almost works, but at the last moment, the droids commanding the ship notice their presence and turns on a ray shield preventing the clones from reaching the ship's reactor. And so, Hardcase takes a fuel pod off of his starfighter and runs right through the ray shield, sacrificing himself. The mission is a tremendous success, and the long-range missile shipments are halted. But immediately after returning to the airbase, Krell has Fives and Jesse arrested for treason. 
The Jedi Master is furious at them and does not give them any trial. Instead, he orders them to be executed immediately. But as Fives and Jesse are lined up before a firing squad, their fellow clones refuse to fire at them and spare their lives. They clearly have sided with their fellow clones against General Krell, which is probably why Palpatine had those control chips inserted in their brains. The clones are far more individualistic than one might think. But before Krell can do anything about the clones' insubordination, their comms receive transmissions and Umbaran forces are preparing to attack the airbase, but this time using captured clone armor and helmets in their vanguard. Krell decides to launch the 501st into a preemptive strike against the enemy, and they meet in the heavy jungles outside the airbase. Casualties quickly begin to mount on both sides as they start opening fire with small arms and mortars. Captain Rex, though, senses something was wrong and closes into melee range and knocks out one of the Umbarns wearing clone armor and finds out that they are, in fact, shooting at the 212th Attack Battalion. Rex quickly calls for a ceasefire, and the two sides stop fighting, shocked by the amount of casualties they have just inflicted on their fellow clones. Rex finds out that the 212th had received the same intel as they have that Umbarans dressed as clones were about to attack them. He then quickly traces that intel directly to General Krell. By this time, Rex has had enough, and he brings a group of clones to confront and arrest the Jedi Master in his tower. Krell admits to being a traitor. He's clearly fallen to the dark side at this point and wants to become Count Dooku's apprentice. A fight ensues between the clones and the Jedi and leads to the outside of the base, where a giant carnivorous plant attacks Krell, distracting him long enough for the clones to step in and stun him. But of course, Krell doesn't last long in captivity as one of the clones ends up shooting him in cold blood. Shortly after, the 212th Attack Battalion under the command of Master Kenobi managed to take the city of Umbara, ceasing all hostilities on the planet. But the clones of the 501st are shook by this incident. They have been betrayed by their commander, the one person they were supposed to obey and trust no matter what. Rex confines in Fives his concerns about the war. He's starting to lose sight of why they were fighting anymore, and he's worried about what will happen to all the clones once the war ends. Chapter 8. Slavery in the Republic the founding document of the Republic the Galactic Constitution states through the Right of Sentience Clause that all sentient beings are created equal. It outlawed slavery and forced servitude and guaranteed protection against such hardships. Legends say that the Galactic Constitution was written almost 25,000 years ago. At the time, it was said that the Right of Sentience Clause was considered very radical. This is because there are many pro-slavery territories and planets within the galaxy. And like any edict or law that's passed by the central government, enforcement was always an issue, especially in areas where you didn't have a lot of influence. There were plenty of slave empires and other territories that traded in slavery, especially in the outer rim of the galaxy. Hut space, for most of its existence, managed to live with amiable diplomatic relations with the Republic, despite having a thriving slave trade. Anakin Skywalker, who grew up as a slave on Tatooine, fondly remembers having an explosive chip in his head that would go off if he tried to run away from his master. Even more worrying were the feline Zygarians, who had built a massive empire in the Outer Rim based on their slaving enterprises. They had refined the enslaving of sentient beings into a fine art and were sort of like the Kaminoans of forced labor. The Jedi Order would eventually launch a campaign against the Zygerian Empire and take out their monarch, freeing most of the slaves there. Most of the Zygerian slavers that were left went underground. During times of peace in the Republic, the Galactic Senate and Judicial Forces had the resources and time to sanction and prevent slavery operations within Republic space. But as the Clone Wars broke out all across the galaxy, resources had to be shifted to fight against the Separatist Alliance. Although the Confederacy of Independent Systems had similar founding principles as the Galactic Republic, there had been rumors that the Separatist Alliance had been employing slavers and had been using slaves for forced labor. In the third year of the Clone Wars, during the Battle of Mon Calamari, the Separatists forced the Corn Isolation Link to enslave their Mon Calamari neighbors and put them into work camps. And now there were rumors in the outer rim of the re-emergence of the Zygerian slave traders and their long dormant empire. Kuros was a beautiful planet, full of green valleys and cascading waterfalls. Located in the expansion region of the galaxy, it was completely unspoiled and undeveloped. The only people living on the surface of this world were a group of peaceful Togrutans who established a pacifist artisan colony. The only resources that are worth taking on this planet were the sentient beings living there. 
Facing an imminent separatist invasion, the Tigrutan governor goes against the Republic's advice and decides to try to negotiate with Count Dooku and sue for peace. The Druid army arrives shortly after, and Dooku is accompanied by a Zygerian noble. Dooku offers the Tigrutan safe passage, aka enslavement, and soon all the people in the colony are peacefully rounded up. Despite realizing that the Republic would arrive too late to really save these people, Yoda still sent Anakin Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Ahsoka Tano to check out the situation. They arrive 10 days after the Separatist invasion and find no sign of the colonists. Dooku had left a small force behind to hold the colony. They are commanded by the Zygerian officer who we saw earlier. And as the Republic troops move into the colony, his commando droids ambush them and soon the clones are engaged in speeder-to-speeder -speeder combat. The Republic forces make quick work of the Separatist droids and quickly secure what's left of the colony. At which point the Zygerian officer calls for a ceasefire and negotiation. Anakin, recognizing his species, immediately wants to handle the situation because of his history with slavery. Obi-Wan Kenobi decides it's better that he go and speak with the Separatist commander. Unfortunately, the Zagarians hate the Jedi almost as much as Anakin hates them and have laid a trap for the Republic forces. They purposely let the Republic march into the colony because they planted bombs in all the buildings around them. To show his series, he sets off one of the explosives, wounding several clones. He demands that Obi-Wan Kenobi surrender, and the Jedi has no choice but to comply. But before he's taken away, Obi-Wan Kenobi decides to challenge the Zygerian officer to a one-on-one -on -one martial contest. This is a deeply rooted part of Zygerian culture, and he knows that the Zygerian officer cannot resist the opportunity to beat him up. If Obi-Wan Kenobi wins this contest, he gets the location of the slaves, along with the location of all of the bombs. The slaver had promised Count Dooku not to kill the Jedi, but he couldn't pass on a chance to pummel his hated enemy, and so the two quickly started fighting each other. Although Obi-Wan Kenobi doesn't have his lightsaber, he still is a Jedi and could use his special abilities to gain the upper hand. But he lets the Zygerian think he has the upper hand so that he can extend the fight as long as possible in order to give Anakin and Ahsoka more time on their own mission. The two Jedi had become ad hoc EOD specialists and were running around the colony looking for the bombs. Their technique for defusing bombs is pretty suspect and would even make Hawkeye and Hurt Locker nervous. Somehow, they managed to defuse all the bombs, which leaves the Zygerian without a bargaining chip. Before the slaver can run away and escape, though, Anakin is stuck aboard a ship and take it over, forcing him to reveal his plans. You see, the Zygerian Queen was holding a royal slavery auction, and it would attract buyers from all around the galaxy. This was a very blatant uh, sign that the Zygerian Empire was once again comfortable enough to trade slaves out in the open. This information is relayed to the Jedi Council. Yoda is worried about the return of slavery to the galaxy. It was a powerful tool for the Sith back when they were in power. And so Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka are sent straight into the heart of the re-emerging slave empire to the planet of Zygeria. Zygeria is located in the Outer Rim, deep in Separatist territory, only a few jumps away from the capital of the entire confederacy, Raxus. The Clone Wars has clearly benefited the world. As the Jedi arrive in their stolen Zygerian slaver ship, they find themselves caught in a heavy line of traffic waiting to enter the planet. Business is good. Their main goal is to find out where exactly all the Kuros colonists are being kept. While Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Rex act as slavers, Ahsoka Tano dresses like a slave. Anakin's plan is to try and charm the Queen and get into her good graces so that they can find out what exactly is going on. Anakin uses his knowledge of Bruno Denturi, the Zygerian commander he had faced on Kuros, to get in an audience with her. Bruno apparently was a hated enemy of the Queen, and Anakin lets her know that he no longer was a problem. He had personally handled the issue. To make the plot even sweeter, Anakin also gives Ahsoka to the Queen, claiming she was one of Bruno's former slaves. The ruse works well, and quickly Anakin becomes a confidant of the monarch, especially after he saves her from one of her own slaves who tries to kill her. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan and Rex visit the slave pits and manage to find Governor Rusty, the leader of the Kuros colony. Unfortunately, the old Tigrutan is too weak and broken to be of any help. Obi-Wan and Rex decide to try and rescue him, but on their way out of the slave pits, the Governor and Kenobi are shot and captured. The Tigrutan is immediately auctioned off to the highest bidder during the auction. He represents the 50,000 Tigrutan colonists that are being held by the Zygerians. Anakin tries to ask the Queen where she was keeping so many slaves at one time, but before she can answer, Obi-Wan Kenobi is paraded out into the arena as well. His capture is a great victory for the Zygerians. The Queen asks Anakin to torture Obi-Wan in front of the crowd for entertainment in order to prove his loyalty. Anakin has to blow his cover and gives a signal to R2-D2 to launch the two Jedi's lightsabers to them, and Obi-Wan and Anakin attempt to break out. 
Captain Rex and Ahsoka try to help them as well, but ultimately there are too many Zygerians there for them to overcome. And their energy whips are a good counter against the Jedi's lightsabers, and the Republic team is quickly recaptured one by one. Ahsoka is hung in a cage like a bird, Anakin becomes the Queen's personal slave and bodyguard, and Obi-Wan Kenobi and Captain Rex are sent to the Zygerian Slave Processing Center on Kadavo in Wild Space, which is where they finally find the location of the rest of the Tigurtans. Kadavo is a pretty messed up place, perfectly designed to break sentient beings and turn them into slaves both physically and mentally. The warden of the facility has particular interest in breaking the Jedi. Although he's never broken a Jedi, he immediately finds out Obi-Wan's weakness. While he can handle torture and physical labor, what Obi-Wan can't stand is seeing other people around him get hurt. And soon, Obi-Wan realizes that whenever he disobeys the slavers or tries to resist, another slave near him will be punished or even killed. Obi-Wan begins to lose hope as the only thing he can do now is just sit and watch people around him suffer. It's a skill that Obi-Wan Kenobi will use once again when he goes into exile on Tatooine where he'll wait for decades watching Luke Skywalker. During his exile, he witnessed many innocents being preyed on by Jabba's gangs, but he was unable to do anything because he was afraid of drawing too much attention. Meanwhile, Count Dooku finally arrives on Zygeria. He's officially sent by Emperor Palpatine to strengthen the ties between the Sith and the Slave Empire. In reality, Palpatine and Dooku want the Zygerians to stop trying to enslave Jedi. It's very likely the Sith are troubled by the Zygerians' ability to control Force sensitives. The Queen, however, refuses to listen to Dooku and is immediately Force choked. Her Prime Minister then betrays her and agrees to take her place and follow the Sith's plan, which is, of course, to kill all of the Jedi. Anakin comes out of nowhere, though, in the last moment and attempts to extract the Queen from the room. He manages to grab her, and Ahsoka Tano, who is also broken free of her cage, is waiting with their ship. Before the Queen dies in Anakin's arms, she tells her where Obi-Wan Kenobi is being held. Anakin and Ahsoka head to Kadavo and quickly launch an assault against the slavers. They also call in some reinforcements in the form of a Republic cruiser and fighter squadron wolf pack led by Plo Koon. The slavers don't really stand much of a chance against their aerial assault. The only bargaining chip the Warden now has is all of his slaves, which he threatens to kill if the Republic don't halt their attack. Obi-Wan and Rex break free inside the compound while Anakin breaches the front door with Ahsoka. With the aerial defenses now down, Republic dropships arrive with more ground reinforcements. Seeing that all is lost, the Warden tries to plunge all of the remaining Tigurtan slaves into the chasm below the facility. Before they all plummet to their deaths, the captain of the Republic cruiser manages to park itself below the facility and clones using jetpacks and cables help rescue them just in time. It's a small victory for the Republic, but only the beginning for slavery's return to the galaxy. When the Empire rises only a year later, the right of sentience is replaced by what's known as high human culture. Chapter 9, Republic Separatist Peace Talks. Now to begin today's episode, we have to go back before the Clone Wars and the Separatist Crisis even started. Although it's called the Clone Wars, this galaxy-wide conflict was actually a civil war, one fought by planets and people that were at one time working together. And while the war quickly escalated and grew out of control, there were still plenty of reasonable people on both sides. Individuals found themselves all of a sudden facing off against friends, colleagues, and even family members who were now supposedly their sworn enemy. In 21 BBY, the second year of the Clone Wars, Senator Padme Amidala goes on a secret mission to the Separatist capital planet of Varaxis. The Senator was concerned that a new bill which had just entered the Senate would continue to escalate the war beyond either side's control. This bill, the Republic Financial Reform Bill, would allow the central government to open new lines of credit with the intergalactic banking clans in return the banks would enjoy further deregulation on their industry. Remember, the Galactic Republic, unlike central governments here on Earth, did not have a central bank or some type of federal reserve. This limited the Republic's ability to continue funding their ever-growing army. The majority of the Republic Senate was more than willing to surrender more power to the executive branch so that a quick and swift end of the war could be achieved. The separate destroyed army had blindsided the Republic, and more troubling seemed to be quite capable in the field, and also their larger numbers put the Republic on the defensive. Every world that the Galactic Republic lost or was unable to protect further degraded the legitimacy of the central government. And this led to an erosion of trust by colonies and planets in the outer rim that were currently under contention. A small minority of senators like Padme, Amidala, Bale, Organa, Mon Motha, and Anaconda Far opposed the Republic's financial reform bill, fearing that the Republic would continue down a path of financial insolvency or further escalate the war. 
The Republic Senate was extremely corrupt. You also had representatives from the Trade Federation, Techno Union, and intergalactic banking clans who were pushing heavily for this bill. This is because their related industries would benefit greatly from a new order of clones, vehicles, ships, and weapons. These factions were also unofficially supporting the Separatist Alliance and playing both sides of the conflict. They were war profiteers, and three of the representatives, Lot Dodd, Gum Sam, and Nix Card, even came up with a plan to convince their contacts within the CIS to launch an attack on Coruscant to levy more support for the military funding bill. Now, backchanneling or unofficial discussion is commonly done by politicians within the same faction. But in the middle of a war, backchanneling with your enemy took a certain amount of courage and preparation. Things can go south pretty quickly. Your own faction might accuse you of treason, especially if your mission is not sanctioned by your government, and the enemy government might just arrest you and accuse you of being a spy if you're found. Although Padme expects no trouble during her mission, it's never a bad idea to bring a Jedi along, especially someone as young and unassuming as Ahsoka Tano. Padme's contact with the Separatist Alliance was Mina Bentori. She was a former mentor of Padme when they both had served in the Senate together before the war. She lived in the capital city of Raxalon on Araxis and was the leader of the peace faction within the Separatist Parliament. Her faction was more open to compromise and wished to bring an end to the fighting. The peace faction in the Separatist Parliament was actually quite similar to Padme's own cohorts, who also wanted to oppose the war on moral grounds. Some members of the peace faction were ideologically opposed to the wartime executive powers granted to Count Dooku, which mirrors Supreme Chancellor Palpatine's own increase in power. Other members of the peace faction were against the newly levied war taxes that Count Dooku had created, whereas others feared that the war would do irreparable damage to the galactic shipping network and supply chains that took centuries to create. Most Separatist Alliance worlds were raw material or heavy industry focused and depended on the population centers in the middle of the galaxy to consume all of their exports. Ahsoka, using her Jedi contacts, manages to successfully sneak Padme and her onto the Separatist capital planet, Araxis. Member of Barlman Bonteri intercepts the two before they reach security. Ahsoka, who, like many young people, saw the world as black and white, was upset by Padme's connection to the supposed enemy. But Bonteri proved to be a graceful host and introduces the two to her son, Lux Bontori. Now, the Bontaris have every reason to hate the Republic. Just last year, Mina Bontori's husband was killed by clone troopers while he was defending a separate base on Aragonar. But the Bontaris were intelligent enough to be able to separate the individual from the faction they belong to. Padme makes a pretty big gamble in telling Bontari about the Senate's new military funding bill. Such discussions could be considered treason in wartime. But she uses this knowledge as leverage to push Bontari to see the urgency of the situation. Padme requests that Bontari put on the Separatist Parliament floor a motion to reopen negotiation channels and peace talks with the Republic. Now, Padme cannot guarantee that the Republic will accept these peace negotiations, and she's definitely not here on behalf of Chancellor Palpatine, but this is basically her best option. The vote for peace negotiations isn't a very radical idea and ends up passing in the Separatist Parliament with an easy majority. The peace faction goes with Bonteri, as does the independence faction. Only the war faction led by the Corporate Alliance opposes the idea. Count Dooku presides over the vote. His public figure at least remains impartial to the vote, promising to preserve democracy. But in secret, he contacts Republic senators with business interests in continuing the war and confirms that a quick attack on Coruscant will quickly derail the entire process. This is sadly a pretty common tactic we see even in our own world. In 2010, peace talks between the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority began. Later that year, an opposition faction to the Palestinian Authority known as Hamas, along with 12 other militant groups, carried out a campaign of attacks targeting innocent Israeli civilians. This attack was not intended to weaken Israel, but specifically target the peace talks between the two sides and derail it, which would also delegitimize the Palestinian Authority, which was mainly run by the Fatah faction, which was opposed to Hamas. It's unfortunately a reoccurring theme in that specific conflict. The Palestinian Authority never seems to have complete control over the Palestinian people, which prevents any type of long-term solution from being created. This also increases the power of more hardline Israeli political factions who are less likely to give any concessions to the Palestinians at all. This is one of the many important lessons that Star Wars can teach us about the real world. Now, we should always be wary of our uh, enemies in a conflict, 
but we also have to look at individuals within our own faction who seek to sabotage any efforts towards peace and reconciliation. At the same time, we might also be lucky enough to find a way to contact like-minded individuals in the enemy faction. Anyway, Count Dooku sends General Grievous to attack the Coruscant power grid with disguised battle droids. This creates a huge power failure in the Senate district right before the Republic Senate can vote on how they want to respond to the Separatist proposal for peace. This not only delays the vote, it also changes public opinion against peace and more support is gained for deregulating the banks and increasing funding for the Grand Army of the Republic. In a retaliatory attack, the Galactic Republic kills several civilian citizens, including a member of Parliament, Mina Bonteri, although it's later found out that she was actually killed by one of Dooku's own agents. A year later in 20 BBY, another peace conference is held on the neutral world of Mandalore. This time, delegates from both the Republic Senate and the Separatist Parliament meet in person to discuss the possibility of peace. Padme Amidala, Mon Mothma, and Bail Organa represent the Republic at the meeting, but facing them is Senator Vo Attell of the Corporate Alliance, leader of the war faction. Mina Bonteri's presence is sorely missing from this meeting. Vo Attell demands that the Republic representatives recognize the legitimacy of the Separatist Alliance on behalf of their Chancellor, which of course is a non-starter. Newly elected junior Senator Lux Von Terry storms into the negotiations and declares his continued loyalty to the Separatist Alliance, but at the same time accuses Count Dooku of treason and ordering the murder of his mother. The Separatist representatives immediately have Bon Terry arrested and taken away, but the Republic representatives are worried about what will happen to him. Remember, Padme is good friends with his mother, and Ahsoka seems to have developed some feelings for the younger Bon Terry. And so Ahsoka extracts Lux from the Separatists before he's executed, causing a small skirmish to break out between the Separatist droids and Republic Senate guards which of course derails the entire peace talk. Ahsoka takes Lux aboard her ship and they're set to travel to Coruscant where he will be granted amnesty to the Republic. But before they even begin their trip, Lux stuns Ahsoka and knocks her out. He has his own plans to meet with the notorious Mandalorian group known as Death Watch. They had recently been unsuccessful in carrying out an uprising against the Duchess of Mandalore, and now they were camped on the planet of Karlak where they continued to gather resources and train their members for another attempt to seize Mandalore. Lux wants to hire this group of talented fighters to kill his sworn enemy, Count Dooku, but soon he finds out just how treacherous the Death Watch can be, especially when they find out his friend Ahsoka happens to be a Jedi, their sworn enemy. Chapter 10, Andoranian Civil War. Andoran was a jungle world located within the inner rim of the galaxy adjacent to the Hapes Consortium. The inner rim is not to be confused with the deep core, which is where Coruscant and many of the more richer worlds are located and isolated from the poverty and violence of the fringes of the galaxy. The inner rim was somewhere midway between the hustle and bustle of civilization and the raw nakedness of wild space, which means it was sort of like a suburbs of the Republic. At the height of the Clone Wars, Andoran found its neighbors Kashyyyk and Umbara under separatist occupation or liberation, depending on who you ask. And so the world of Andoran was very much on the front lines of the Galactic War. Andoran, like many of its galactic neighbors, was settled a little later in history. Somewhere around 5,200 to 4,600 BBY, the first human settlers arrived on colony ships. They found themselves in a world covered by lush and beautiful jungles, but found out quickly beneath that beauty was an extremely dangerous ecosystem full of apex predators and other terrifying fauna. Andoran had four separate moons, and legends say the largest, Jun, used to orbit the planet so closely that animals would fly between the two celestial bodies. The first settlement on Andoran was just a basic encampment, which soon was surrounded by a fortification due to the dangerous animals that lived in the area. Eventually, that settlement would grow into the planet's capital of Isis. But not all Andoranians would choose to live behind the giant walls of Isis. In 4400 BBY, Sith Lord Freedon Nod conquered the planet and ruled it with an iron fist Sith theocracy. His followers were cultists known as Nadis. The Nadis wanted to impose martial law in the city of Isis and they basically kicked out all of the criminal elements or in my opinion, the more free and open-minded people of the city out into the wilderness. Back then, when you were expelled from the walls of Isis, it was more or less considered a death sentence. But somehow these exiles learned how to survive and then 
flourish in the jungles around Isis. These exiles would eventually be called beast riders for they had even tamed the largest predators and animals in the jungles and used them for transportation, labor, and war. These beast riders would eventually come into conflict with the city folk still living in Isis and for hundreds of years the two sides would skirmish against each other until the Galactic Republic first made contact with the planet in 4002 BBY. The Beast Riders would become recognized as one of the most fearsome groups of warriors in the galaxy, and they even managed to help the planet repel an early Mandalorian crusade. But as the year went on and the Republic brought more peace and stability to the region, the Beast Riders also started returning to the city and socializing and returning back to a normal lifestyle. By the time of the Clone Wars, the Beast Riders' numbers had shrank considerably. Many of them who could not acclimate to life in the cities became criminals and mercenaries. At the beginning of the Separatist Crisis and Clone Wars, Onderon, under the leadership of Monarch Ramses Dendup, stayed neutral. The King was pro-Republic, but at the time, the federal government was quite weak, and individual planets still held quite a lot of power, especially because there was no federal military to back up the Republic's mandate. This was one of the core problems the Republic faced on a daily basis. King Dendum actually believed that both sides in the conflict were wrong and inherently full of corrupt political entities. Therefore, he wanted to keep the bloodshed off of his planet. But the Separatists and Count Dooku saw Onderon as an important linchpin power in the region. If Onderon joins the Separatists, then many other inner rim planets might also become open to that possibility. This would be a very profitable situation for the Separatists who have yet to have penetrated that deeply into the core of the galaxy. And so the Separatists began searching for an usurper that they could appoint as a puppet regent and found Sanjay Rash. Rash quickly overthrew Ramses and put him in jail and took control of the capital and opened the gates for a Separatist occupation. Once Onderon officially joined the Separatist Alliance, several loyalists and supporters of King Dendub escaped into the jungles and started the Onderonian Rebellion. The organization was led by Stila Guerrera and her brother Saw Guerrera. They took on the traditions of the Beast Riders of old and fled into the jungles surrounding the capital city where they set up camp, built up supplies, and started preparing for an all-out guerrilla war against the Rash regime. Senator Mina Bonteri, who we mentioned in our previous video, was the representative of the planet and a part of the peace faction in the Separatist Parliament. She had secretly been assassinated by Count Dooku after she attempted to back-channel with Republic Senator Padme Amidala about a potential peace talk. A year later, Lux Bontario would return home to Onderon and join the rebellion. He found this motley group of resistance fighters in a terrible state. They had figured out how to survive in the wilderness, but beyond that, they lacked weapons and training to mount a proper insurgency against the well-armed Separatist-backed puppet government. Luckily, Lux Vontori had a thing with Ahsoka Tano a few episodes back, and so he was able to use his connection with her to plead the rebel's case in front of the Jedi Council. He probably should have left the hot-headed Saw Gerrera out of the holocom call because more considered Jedi like Obi-Wan Kenobi were wary of getting involved in such an internal conflict. After all, the local government had officially stated their support for the Separatist Alliance, and this resistance group had no legitimate claim to the throne. The Jedi had to be careful before meddling into what is basically domestic politics. Anakin, however, saw a very clear opportunity for the Republic to gain some more allies and potentially even regain some planets at an extremely low cost. All they needed to provide were some basic guidance and training so that these smaller resistance movements would become more efficient at fighting against their governments using guerrilla warfare and attacking soft targets. Obi-Wan reminds Anakin that there's a very thin line between the term freedom fighter and terrorist, which is an interesting comment and honestly sheds a lot of light on our own geopolitical system in our world today. Almost every major power in the world invests in foreign internal defense and also aids insurgency opposition groups. This usually involves providing basic supplies and weapons along with trainers and even air support to so-called friendly forces with aligned interests and similar goals. Of course, more often than not, countries end up backing the wrong people. For instance, the CIA was reported to have armed Arab Mujahideen fighters, including Osama bin Laden, during the Afghan-Soviet War in the 1980s. At the time, Osama bin Laden was actually pretty pro-American and happy for their support against the Soviet atheists. And it seems like Obi-Wan Kenobi also understands this very important lesson of arming insurgency groups. Just because they are the enemy of your enemy does not make them good friends. Nonetheless, Anakin's passion and logic prevails. His idea for a low-profile and low-cost training program, which could create headaches for the Separatist government, 
wins support from the Jedi Council. Mace Windu, who also has a sharp military mind, is open to trying out this new type of warfare and sees Onderon as a good testing ground for training pro-Republic insurgents. Yoda allows the mission to go forward, but wants the Jedi to only observe and train. They are only supposed to be advisors and not combatants. Obi-Wan Kenobi also volunteers to go on the mission to watch what Anakin is doing. The Republic advisors quickly begin drilling and training the Onderon rebels in a specific type of guerrilla warfare. They learn how to take out Separatist destroyer droids as well as how to disable a Separatist armored assault tank. Captain Rex, who's used to drilling shinies, takes the lead and shows the rebels how to most efficiently tackle each combat situation. And the training ends just in time because the Confederacy are on their way to attack the rebel camp and the Onderonians are able to immediately test out the new tactics they've just learned. They barely are able to survive the battle and a large part of that has to do with the three Jedi and clone soldier that was helping them. In the aftermath of the battle, the rebels have a decision to make. Either retreat further back into the jungle and establish a new outpost, or go on the offensive. The rebels choose the latter. They realize that this is not a battle about tactical or even strategic victories. They need to inspire the people to come out and support the rebellion. A lesson that Sagarera has a problem learning now, and also for the rest of his life. And so the rebels enter back into the city of Isis and begin launching a series of guerrilla attacks in the city. They focus on taking out small confederacy patrols and are able to limit collateral damage, but also maximize their exposure to the people. But it's still quite not enough to encourage the average civilian to join the rebellion. They need to make an even larger scene to show the people that they can defeat this puppet regime. The Jedi advisors by this time have already finished their job and they return back to the wider war, leaving only Ahsoka Tano behind to observe any further operations. The Onoranian rebels immediately hatch a plan to steal a Separatist tank and use it to attack the power generators that fuel all of the droid armies in the city. A victory here will both be tactically important but also show just how formidable the Onoranian rebels are. The attack ends up being successful. This greatly worries King Rasha's regime and he quickly calls for reinforcements from Count Dooku and the Separatist Alliance, which results in a super tactical droid who takes over control of the occupying droid army. In order to draw the rebels out into the open, Rash decides to hold a public execution for the former monarch Dendum. The Andoranian rebel leadership are unsure of how to act. Sensing a trap, the more cautious Steela believes that they should wait until King Dendump is brought into public before they attempt to rescue him. While Saw Gerrera, hot-headed as ever, wants to attack the ISIS prison and save Dendump before the event can even happen. Saw manages to infiltrate the prison but is captured immediately and tortured by the super tactical droids. Saw might be brash and a bit stupid, but he sure is brave and doesn't break under interrogation or give up any of the other resistance members. The next day, Saw and Dendup are both paraded out for an execution. Steel and the rebels still launch their rescue attempt, but ultimately are defeated and forced to surrender. But before they can be taken away, General Tandon of the Onderon Royal Guard defects and helps the rebels escape with Dendup. Seeing Saw Gerrera get tortured was enough to convince General Tandon that he was on the wrong side of the conflict. On their way out, the citizens of ISIS start to rise up as well. Although they have won the day, the rebels now have the Separatist army's full and undivided attention. They regroup in the highlands east of ISIS and must now fortify their position against the coming Separatist attack. So far, the Andoranians have been using guerrilla tactics to defeat the Separatist destroyed army, but now they must prove that they can also win a conventional battle. Unfortunately, the Separatists have a new weapon at their disposal, the HMP droid gunship and it proves to be extremely difficult for the Onderonians to take down. Not even the Beast Riders stand a chance. So just like the Afghan Mujahideen fighters facing the Soviet hind assault choppers, the Onderonians needed a shoulder launch anti-aircraft solution. Luckily, the Jedi knew a sketchy pirate arms dealer named Hondo Anaka, who has just the right tool for the job. The rockets end up arriving just in time for the battle, and the Onderonians manage to hold back and defeat the Separatist attack. Unfortunately, Steel Guerrero, the better half of the Guerreros, is killed in action. Chapter 11, Becoming a Padawan. At the arena skirmish during the Battle of Geonosis, the Jedi Order lost 179 of the 212 members they sent to rescue Obi-Wan Kenobi. Prior to the start of the Clone Wars, the Jedi Order perhaps lost that many of its members in combat situations every century. The Golden Age of the Republic was a time of peace and stability, and now it was all over. 
the Jedi were quickly losing more members than they could replace. Now, at the beginning of the Clone Wars, there were roughly 10,000 members in the Jedi Order, but actually not every Jedi was specialized in combat. There were many different professions within the Order aside from being a Jedi Knight. One could be a part of the Agriculture Corps or the Survey Corps or maybe uh, become a navigator or even a seeker who would go around finding new recruits for the Jedi Order. Only the most talented Jedi Padawans would actually be chosen for apprenticeship by a Jedi Knight or a Jedi Master. Everyone else would end up in one of the professions we mentioned before. But all Jedi do start out as junglings or initiates before they could be called Padawans and be eligible for apprenticeship. They also had to go through a series of trials, including one known as the Gathering. See, tens of thousands of years ago, a Jedi navigator using the Force made a hyperspace jump into the relatively unstable Unknown Region. The Unknown Region was incredibly difficult to navigate using traditional methods because of the high density of gravitational anomalies that could be found there. The Jedi Navigator had been drawn to the planet because of its powerful presence within the Force. Although there was no sentient life on the planet, the scout found several different forms of non-sentient animals. Jedi survey teams were later sent onto the location and found massive quantities of kyber crystals, the key component and energy amplifier for a lightsaber. As per Republic law and Jedi doctrine, the Order quickly sent artisans, scholars, and warriors to secure the planet. It was decided by the Jedi Council that the planet would be kept a secret from the rest of the galaxy. This means it was taken off of all star maps and records. The Jedi found out very early on that kyber crystals were actually semi-intelligent and had a living presence in the Force. The Jedi were always drawn towards these kyber crystals and developed a very unique bond with the crystals they placed within their weapon. They also realized that these crystals had an energy amplification quality to them, which could be very useful for a variety of different applications. But of course, the Jedi were a very conservative and dogmatic bunch. Certain things like the Force and midichlorians, along with kyber crystals, were considered taboo subjects to study scientifically. The Jedi believed that scientific understanding of something like the Force would eventually lead people to experimenting and trying to change the Force, which of course would be very blasphemous and a very dark side action. The Jedi sought to be one with the Force, and the Sith sought to bend the Force to its will. And so, the Jedi not only controlled every planet where kyber crystals could be found, the Republic also helped them control the supply of kyber crystals so that it became very difficult for anyone to acquire any of them if they weren't a Jedi. Galen Ursa, one of the premier specialists on kyber crystal energy amplification, could only get his hands on larger crystals after Order 66. His research would eventually lead to the Death Star Super Laser. Anyway, the Jedi on Elum managed to build a gigantic temple which guards the entrance to one of the many kyber cave crystals on the planet. As per Jedi tradition, a group of the most talented Jedi younglings in their class would board the ancient ship, the Crucible, and journey to Alum for the gathering ceremony. In 20 BBY, the gathering consisted of six younglings and Jedi Padawan Ahsoka Tano, who served as their escort. Once they arrived, they found Grand Master Yoda waiting for them. As busy as the Clone Wars kept Yoda, the gathering was seen as an extremely important event that warranted his presence. Now, the first step in the ceremony was actually entering the mine, which was guarded by a gigantic ice wall. Using the Force, several kyber crystals needed to be arranged in a certain position to allow sunlight to pass through them, which transformed the light into a heat ray, which would then melt the door. This would leave the crystal cave open for a limited time. Once the sun goes down, the ice wall would reform again, and anyone still in the cave would be trapped. The younglings would then enter the cave and harvest the kyber crystal, which sounds a lot easier than it actually was. For one, kyber crystals look quite similar to other crystals found inside the cave, and they were quite rare. One really needed the force to help them find it. But as we mentioned before, each kyber crystal is semi-intelligent and in a way chooses the youngling as much as the youngling chooses it. But in order to be deemed worthy, each youngling must overcome a challenge that usually tests their greatest weakness. Biff, the cowardly Ithorian, must face and conquer his sphere in order to find his crystal. Zat, the tech Sevi Natalan, relies too heavily on his scanners and other devices and must now rely on the Force alone to find his crystal. Gunji, the impatient Wookiee, must learn patience and calm in order to find his crystal. All the other Jedi younglings died in a cave-in, unfortunately, because the Jedi Order was not up to date with all of their safety regulations and standards. Just kidding, but you get the point. 
The Kyber Crystal is an important reminder to each and every Jedi that they are only as strong as their biggest weakness, and as they continue their journey through life, they'll have to make sure that they continue to understand this lesson. The Crucible, for all you Starship nerds out there, is actually a very interesting vessel. While this might look like a restoration, what we're actually looking at is an original Paladin-class Corvette from the Old Republic era. Professor Wu Young, who operates the ship, says it's older than a thousand years, which means it was around even before the Rusan Reformation. During this period, the Jedi militarized and were fighting a devastating galactic-wide war against the Sith. Professor Wu Young is kind of like the Mr. Ollivander of the Star Wars world. Within his Corvette was a small workshop outfitted with every material and item one might need to build a lightsaber. For instance, for the Wookiee Gunji, Mr. Hu Young has a special grip made out of Brylark Tree, an incredibly durable wood from the Wookiee home planet of Kaishik. Now, the actual process of assembling a lightsaber was quite difficult. Professor Hu Young provides the instructions to the younglings, but everything must be done through the Force. It's said that non-Force users would be unable to assemble a lightsaber without the Force, which most likely was a safety feature within its design. Now, usually after these younglings have finished their lightsabers, they would have gone back to the Jedi Order Temple on Coruscant for what's known as the Initiate Trials. But this time around, Honda Anaka and his pirate band manages to intercept the Crucible in subspace. The pirates see a huge profit in seizing the Kyber Crystals and selling them on the black market for a ridiculous price. A ridiculous price that ironically was caused by the Jedi Order's monopoly over the Crystals in the first place. The pirates quickly disable the Crucible's engines and board the ship. You might think a bunch of Jedi younglings might be able to repel even the most hardened pirates. The truth is, as we saw in the Trandoshan Wildlife Preserve episode, untrained Jedi and even Jedi Padawans sometimes had difficulties dealing with full-grown adults. Ahsoka Tano, of course, was an exception to that rule. She was immensely talented in the Force and combat. But most of the younglings on board were still children with a limited amount of control over the Force. In combat, sometimes they could be as useless as a normal child would be. In this case, the younglings are forced to rise up to the occasion. After Ahsoka Tano is neutralized and kidnapped, the younglings have the option to pursue the pirates back to their base on the planet of Florum. Using their combined technical skills, they manage to fix the Crucible and fly to the planet, where they infiltrate a carnival troop scheduled to perform for the pirates. This turns into an elaborate rescue plan, which somehow is successful. In times of galactic war or chaos, Jedi oftentimes got battlefield promotions. Obi-Wan Kenobi was turned into a Jedi Knight after defeating Darth Maul during the Battle of Naboo. And all of these younglings under Ahsoka Tano's care probably should have been considered for a promotion to Padawan automatically. They had proven quite resourceful and capable without any adult leadership and successfully carried out an elaborate rescue mission. But of course, during more normal times, as we mentioned before, these younglings would have went to the Initiate Trials. These were three tests that were designed to gauge an apprentice's progress. The first part of the test focused on the youngling's knowledge of the Jedi Code. This included your usual memorization you might expect in a normal education test. The second part of the test actually varied depending on what era the Jedi Order was in. Uh, originally, the second part of the test was designing a lightsaber and building it. After the Rusan Reformation, the second trial became about self-discipline and demonstrating one's ability to meditate or using a lightsaber in combat with their vision obscured. The Jedi testers in this trial focused on a user's technique rather than their natural skill. The third trial also differed depending on the time period for those who were in the order before the Rusan Reformation. This usually meant going on a mission or performing a task. Even earlier on, when the Jedi Council was located on Datooine, an initiate had to find the dark side within themselves and figure out a way to conquer it. During the Golden Age of the Republic after the Rusan Reformation, the final test became about just proving their connection to the Force. After they pass all of these trials, they would go on to the next step, which would be probably attending the annual Apprentice Tournament. It's kind of like a combine where all of these young Padawans would gather. The students would demonstrate their combat and force skills against each other in front of a crowd of Jedi Masters and Knights. So at the end of the third year of the war, the Republic is starting to gain a lot of ground against the Separatist Alliance, especially now that their economy is more military-oriented. Uh, in our next season of this history series, we're going to be covering the fourth and final year, which will also be covering the last uh, season of the Clone Wars, which isn't over 
yet. So we're gonna wait a little bit before we actually start that series. Well, I hope you enjoyed this massive video, guys. Stay safe out there. Uh, and uh, also don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our content. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.